work our way through to verse, uh, verse 38. Okay? Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. So hopefully this is all familiar stuff to you. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favoured one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. And therefore also, that Holy One who is born, uh, sorry, who is to be born, will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and is now the sixth month for her, who is called barren. For with God nothing is impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So I just want to point out a couple of things from those few verses that we've read from that story. In verse 27, it talks about Mary, who was betrothed or engaged to a man called Joseph, of the house of David. Now, David was one of the greatest kings in Israel. And this young girl, she was probably only a teenager at the time, she was of the direct bloodline in the kings of Israel. So even though there was no king of Israel at the time, her family bloodline could be traced right back to the greatest kings of Israel. She was of the royal family, of the royal line of that nation. In verse 28, she's talking to Gabriel, who is one of the most powerful angels in the universe. And this angel says to her, a young teenage girl, rejoice, you are highly favoured. Now that's an incredible statement. This young woman is highly favoured. Now that is like God's commendation of her, sent by this angel. All right, So keep that in mind as well. In verse 32 there, this son who is who's going to be born from her called Jesus, he is going to be great. And at the end of that verse there, God will give him the throne of his father, David. Now, David was not his father. It was his great, 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 many great grandfathers back. But he was going to be, he was going to be a king who was going to be similar to David, better in fact. David was a, one of the greatest kings, but Jesus was going to be even better. So the Bible equates them together, okay? And calls David the father of Jesus because of that. In verse 33, it says he is going to reign over the house of Jacob. Now the house of Jacob is another name for uh, the nation of Israel. So he's going to reign over the nation of Israel and then of his kingdom there will be no end. So if there's going to be no end to his kingdom and he's going to rule over it forever, this child that was going to be born called Jesus was going to have to be immortal because he was going to rule over that kingdom forever. So see the things that you can draw out from this simple Christmas story that we hear every year is actually so much deeper than what, you, what you've probably ever heard of before. And then in verse 35, last of all, the angel says at the end of verse 35, he who is to be born will be called the Son of God. 
So he's, the, God's Holy Spirit was going to work on Mary and was going to create in her a child which was going to be Mary's son and it was going to be because the Holy Spirit was going to conceive in Mary it was going to be the son of God at the same time. This was going to be an extremely special child and right from his birth the angel tells Mary he is going to be a king that is going to reign forever. That was the promise that God gave to to Mary before Jesus was even born. Now that is quite an astounding thing for Mary. I mean, Mary was just gobsmacked. It says she kept all these things in her heart in another chapter. I mean, what else could she do? She, she couldn't say anything else. This was the angel from God. Now you would think that Mary, let's go to this slide, that Mary being the um, one of the descendants of the kingly line of the nation of Israel would have wealth or status in society. She would have a position of preeminence, of importance within that nation because of who she was. And she would have money behind her, she would have influence and she would have power. You would also think that the religious leaders would have welcomed this miracle baby. This was the baby who was the subject of so many of their prophecies in their own Bible. They were looking for the saviour. You would think that the religious leaders would have crowded around this boy and given him exclusive access to intense religious upbringing, to the best teachers in the land. You would also think that the people who were also looking for Messiah or the saviour at the time would have wanted to get close to this boy. They would want to know him. They would want to be, bring gifts and shower them upon him. And you'd also think that being the son of God, he would have special privileges, that God would help him along or give him, you know, do miracles or give him wealth or power. You would think that this should happen. But the reality is that Mary was probably an orphan, a penniless orphan, an outcast of society who no one paid attention to. The reality is that Joseph, the man who he, she was engaged to, was just a humble carpenter who worked with wood for a living. They lived in the poor parts of the land where no one important came from Nazareth. That's what, that's what the, uh, the sort of notoriety of Nazareth where they lived was. Well, no one important comes from there. And his birth was always treated as scandalous because his mother was found to be with a child before she was married to her father. Uh, sorry, before she was married to Joseph. So his birth was always treated as, you know, uh, something we, mm, we don't know what happened there, but something dodgy went on. All right? And so his, his own family, Mary and Joseph's own family, turned their back on Mary and Joseph and Jesus. And Jesus was born in extremely humble circumstances. You know, when they went back to Nazareth, when they went back there, they had family there because that's where Joseph was from. But we find that, actually, was, was, no, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, wasn't it? Sorry, I've confused the towns there. They had to go back to Bethlehem to be taxed. So Jesus was born in Bethlehem. That was where Joseph's family was from. That was his hometown. Now, Joseph would have known people in the town, people that he could have gone and stayed with. And yet, with a heavily pregnant wife just about to give birth, and in his own hometown, he's knocking on the doors of all the local hotels trying to find a room for the night because Joseph's family had turned their backs on him because of the circumstances of which his pregnant wife was found to be with child. So the whole thing is a little bit... A little bit rough it's a little bit crude like it, it's not nice and Jesus himself was born in a manger probably a dirty dark cave without any light if they were lucky they might have had a candle because no one would give them lodgings a poor a poor heavily pregnant woman that's the reality of this story King Herod the king of the time became fearful of rumors about this baby and tried to have him killed in his life, the religious leaders rejected him. They rejected his teaching. They rejected him as a heretic. 
And Joseph seems to have died when Jesus was quite young. So Jesus became the provider of, a fa- of the family. He became the father figure and had to provide for at least seven people. We know that there was five boys in the family from the, from the, um, from the Bible. Five boys and at least one sister, probably more. In, and so five boys, uh, Mary, and at least one sister was at least seven people that Jesus became the provider and father figure for because he was the eldest. He himself was a carpenter like his father, like, he, like his father Joseph. His own brothers and sisters eventually turned against him when he started teaching the things of God. When he began, began his ministry, his own brothers and sisters rejected what he was saying and turned away from him. He was abandoned by his apostles or his disciples. When he was about to be crucified, his disciples, his best friends, ran away in fear lest they also be caught up and be killed. And he was killed by jealous religious leaders of the time as a common criminal. So while we might think this son of God, this amazing man who walked the earth 2,000 years ago, might have been a great leader, a revolutionary, God's own son, God's own presence on the earth, Actually, he was rejected, he was despised, and people didn't want to have anything to do with him. Some people. Others loved him. What was God doing here? Well, God was developing in Jesus, his son, a character. God was shaping his son into a beautiful living, breathing version of his word. What do I mean by that? Well, John chapter 1 and verse 14 says, so verse 14 of John 1, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's a really simple phrase. What does that mean? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Well, what that means is that there was God's word, And there was Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was the very living, breathing version of the black and white words on paper. Jesus was an amazing, loving, caring, wonderful man. That was exactly what God wanted to see in a human being. That's what his word was in a fleshly form. And Jesus Christ became an example for anybody who wanted to live a godly life. That's what they should follow. That's what they should model their lives on. That's what it means when it says, Jesus was the word made flesh. And through the suffering and through the things that Jesus experienced, God shaped this character and taught the Lord Jesus Christ love and compassion and mercy for other people. That's what God was doing through all of those circumstances in life. Jesus was not a privileged person because he was the son of God. In fact, God probably made it harder for Jesus than anybody else on the earth. So he had to really want to do the right thing. It was a hard life for him. Let's have a look at some of the principles that he lived by because what I think this sets up for us is the contrast to what we see in the world today. We talk about kings, we talk about rulers, we talk about leaders. But really, when we talk about Jesus, the way that we see kings and rulers and and leaders is almost the opposite of what Jesus was. But Jesus was a godly ruler, a godly leader. So the kings of this world or the rulers of this world They exercise power over others. But in Luke 22, it tells us that Jesus came to serve. He humbled himself for the benefit of others. And if you recall the Last Supper, you may have heard of that phrase, the Last Supper, Jesus took on himself the role of a servant and washed his disciples' feet. Now, it was a custom that a servant would do that job because when you were walking through the Holy Land in in those days, there was all sorts of animal 
feces and stuff on the ground, mud, dirt, your feet would be dirty when you came into a house. It was the role of a servant to actually wash the guest's feet. None of Jesus' disciples, when they entered into the room for dinner together, took on that role. So Jesus took the bucket of water and washed their feet to show as an example of what others should, should do to each other. The kings of this world have wealth to do whatever they want to and poor people pay taxes to rich kings. Jesus, on the other hand, had no possessions in this life and he urged his disciples to sell all and give to the poor and follow him. That was Jesus' method of living. Jesus says, I don't even have anywhere to lay my head. Foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of God doesn't even have anywhere to sleep. That was how many possessions he had in this life. And last of all, the kings and the rulers of this world, they used violence and force. But Matthew and Luke both say that Jesus would not fight. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and a crowd of armed soldiers came to take him to be crucified, Jesus said to them, who have, who have you come here for? And they said, we've come to seek Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I'm the one, take me and let my disciples go free. Now, one of Jesus' disciples at that point in time drew a sword and took a wild slash and cut off one of the people's ear that was there. And Jesus said to him, put away your sword. I could call thousands of angels at this point and they would fight for me. But that is not what God wants. And he touched the servant's ear and healed it. So he was caring and loving even to those who wanted to come and do him harm. And 1 Peter 2 verse 21 says, Jesus never retaliated. He always returned good for evil. That was the principles that he lived in his, in his life. And why? Why did he do that? We'll come to Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2 takes all of that stuff we've looked at there and absolutely just it crystallises it into one verse, the reasons behind this. And we want to start reading at verse 7. Or well, actually, verse 5 we'll start reading at because it gives us the context. Philippians 2 verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now that verse is a little hard to understand. We're not going to explain that tonight, but I will acknowledge that that second, that verse 6 there is a little hard to understand. But just take it that we're talking about Jesus Christ. In verse 7, he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. So even though he was the son of God, he became a servant to all those who dealt with. And instead of elevating himself as the son of God, he acknowledged that he was a man like everybody else because he was the son of Mary. And verse 8, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So even when he died and was crucified, that was an act of obedience because he did not fight against those that sought his harm. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the reason that Jesus is going to be the king of the world is because he committed his life to God. He humbled himself. He sought no reputation of his own. He never sought to elevate himself, but he committed his whole life solely to God 
And because he did that, and, and to the benefit of others, and because he did that, God has taken him and made him the king of the world. That's why. So Jesus Christ, despite being the perfect son of God, was able to mix with all sorts of people because he saw himself as a servant, because he didn't elevate himself above anyone else, because he looked on all men and he saw that all needed saving from death, even himself, he needed saving from death. So he was able to mix with the outcasts of society, but he was equally able to mix with the religious elite because everyone was equal. Everyone was going to die, and without God's salvation, no one would be saved. That's how Jesus saw himself before all men. And he filled the part of a loving saviour and showing the love and the mercy of God to all men, no matter what walk of life you came from. So he treated everyone the same. And come over to Luke chapter 2, because Luke chapter 2 has quite a fascinating statement in it. Luke chapter 2 and verse 52. Okay, so in verse 52 of Luke chapter 2, it says that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. This is as he grew up and in favour with God and man. Now that is quite a fascinating verse. The reason behind it, but why it's a fascinating verse, is because when we come over to Proverbs, come over to Proverbs chapter 3, it gives us an explanation of what that actually means. Proverbs chapter 3, and verse 3 and 4. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck, write them in, your, in the tablet of your heart, and so find favour and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Now, mercy and truth are like opposites to each other. Truth, righteousness... What is right, what is truthful, is on one side. Mercy, long-suffering, patience, love, is another set of characteristics on the other side. And usually, in life, we either are one or the other, or we're flicking between one or the other. The Bible says Jesus maintained perfectly the balance of mercy and truth in all that he did. Now that is an astounding characteristic. What that meant was that he always did what was right before God. He always upheld the principles of God. But at the same time, in doing that, he always showed love, compassion and mercy to mankind. So he always was able to satisfy. He had the wisdom, the insight, and the ability to satisfy both God and man in everything he did. Now, what more could you want in a leader than to be, pardon me, to be fair yet strict, to be merciful yet truthful, to be righteous but loving, to be compassionate, but I can't think of anything on the other side. In perfect balance, in every decision, in every choice you made. That's not what we see from the kings, from the rulers, from the leaders of this world. So the two reasons that Jesus Christ is the best person to be the king of the whole world is one, he humbled himself to be the servant of all mankind so that they could be saved. He committed his life to God. And secondly, he learnt the perfect balance between pleasing God and loving mankind. 
Because mankind naturally does not necessarily want to do what is right and doesn't want to do what God wants him to do. But Jesus was able to have the wisdom to be able to have that perfect balance of character. So they're the two reasons why Jesus Christ is going to be the king of the world and why we want him to be the king of the world. And Tim's now going to go through how he will govern in the, in the world to come. To Jamie. We have, we do, we're definitely not crossing over very much, but we're crossing over a whole heap because how he governs is exactly about who he is, isn't it? It's, this is the wonderful man that is Jesus Christ and how he's going to look after the world as, as the king of it. So our first quote tonight to look at, I'm not going to look at very many tonight. I want to have a bit more dialogue if that you know, doesn't scare you too much. I want to have a look at Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11 and verses 3 to 4. Because there's so many quotes you can look at that talk about the way Jesus Christ is going to relate to us, but I want to look at some really simple ones and just get a real simple picture for us tonight. Isaiah chapter 11, God is prophesying about the coming of Jesus Christ. He says there's going to come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, starting right in verse 1 there, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now, Jesse was David's father. So Jesse was King David's father, so we're talking about King David's line where Jesus Christ came from. A branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of God will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of God. So some wonderful ideas in there. This, this is a man who's going to think like God. That's how you can understand this idea of spirit. He's going to think the way God does. And, and Jamie brought out that verse in John chapter 1 that Jesus Christ was exactly like the way God thought. He's going to have wisdom and understanding, counsel and might. So these, these balancing ideas are all perfected in Jesus Christ. Knowledge and of the fear of God. So perfect fear for his Father, our God, but knowledge as well. And from a very young age, he had that knowledge. But in verse 3, we've got some really lovely thoughts. His delight is in the fear of God which means following God's ways, absolutely. But he's not going to judge like we do with the sight of our eyes, not decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. This is where that truth and fear of God comes into it. And with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. So, He's got these perfectly balanced ideas. He wants to be really, really good and compassionate and kind and caring for the poor and for the meek. But at the same time, the wicked are going to see him, see the other side of Jesus Christ. And we've talked about that in the first couple of nights that we had together about when Jesus Christ comes right in the middle of Armageddon there to wipe out those ones who are coming against Israel. So just already in, you know, I kind of like the way Jamie was presenting it a bit before, you know, the kings of this world versus the way Jesus Christ is going to do things. The kings of this world have got their eyes and their ears and their pockets. What does the lobbyist have to say? Who's paying the most money for my favour? Jesus Christ is going to look after the poor, the ones who can't afford to buy his love and affection. And he's going to look after the ones who aren't so pretty, the ones who need him the most, the meek of the earth. Really, really right down the bottom. Imagine a king who instead of caring for all the, you know, the king's court maybe, the princes, the, the fancy people of the land, this is a king whose biggest concern is for the people right down the very bottom. This is one of the beautiful things about Christ's kingdom. The second one I wanted to bring you to was in Matthew chapter 22. And we'll spend a lot of time in Matthew tonight. Because when it comes to the way the kingdom of God is going to work, we don't know exactly what the laws of that kingdom are going to be. We know about the laws that Moses had way back in Moses' time, thousands and thousands of years ago. But they were laws made for people in the desert, animal sacrifices, those sorts of things, to help them understand God. These aren't the same laws that you'd need in when Jesus Christ is reigning over the earth and you've got angels walking around everywhere. It's kind of different. But Jesus Christ boils them down, boils them down to the brass tacks so we can take a grip and go, 
what was it all about? What were all those laws about and what did it mean to him? And somebody asked him in verse 36. So the, the Pharisees heard his silence, the Sadducees, so those, those are some religious groups. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. They're trying to see if they can get Jesus Christ to trip up. Lawyer here meant religious lawyer. They knew their Bible back to front. But they didn't know what it meant in their heart. And he said to him, teacher, buttering him up. What's the great commandment in the law? And Jesus says to him, and he probably gets this answer right, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. God comes first. This is the most important law in the kingdom of God. God comes first. And the second is like it, right up the top there. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, all the law and the prophets, you can put the Old Testament there. On these two commandments hangs the Old Testament, the way God works with the world, the way he worked with them then, and the way he wants to work with us in the kingdom of God. Love God, keep his commandments, and love your neighbour as yourself. If you can just keep these two things in your mind, you can understand exactly how the kingdom is going to proceed and how we should relate to one another and how we should relate to God. So some really, really simple ideas about how Jesus Christ is going to reign. And then last year, I was having a bit of a chat to one of my friends. It was around the time when everyone was going, oh, Donald Trump, there's no way he's going to get in. Everyone was jumping around talking about politicians and politicians' promises and elections and speeches. And someone said to me something a bit interesting. They said, have you ever considered Matthew chapter 5, which has got the Beatitudes, those shown up there, have you ever considered that as Jesus Christ's vote for me speech? Maybe not quite that crass, you know, doesn't need to be that serious. But this is right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry when he's presenting these words. It's called, usually called the Sermon on the Mount. You can call it whatever you like. He's just started to come into the land of Israel He's been healing the sick and he's got a great multitude following him. And in Matthew, these are the first words that we have from him in a great speech that tells us about what he's thinking, about what he understands about the kingdom of God. Because if you look at the end of Matthew chapter 4, from verse 23, he goes about Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing. Just, just that. That's all he's doing, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing. So if that's all that Jesus Christ is caring about, then in that context, this is all about the kingdom of God. This is his promise of how he intends to rule it and what he wants his kingdom to look like. So I wanted to go through some of these with you so we can get a real picture of what these blessings are about and what these characteristics are for. Because when you, when you read through them, you can read through them kind of quickly and you can get caught up in the language a bit and not really understand the practical aspect of it. So if we're reading through, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So when we're talking about the kingdom of God, this is right in the thick of it. But what does it actually mean to be poor in spirit? One of the kids want to tell me, what, what does it mean to be poor? Go for it. Don't have much money. You don't have much of something, do you? That's, that's what poor is. But what, what does being poor in spirit mean? Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. So your spirit, it's like your energy, isn't it? We talk about high-spirited people because they're bouncing around, bouncing off the walls, high-spirited horses that just run for days. So if that's high-spirited, low-spirited kind of means something a bit unusual. Does it mean someone who's got no energy? One of the ways I tried to think about this one, try to give you a bit of a picture of it, imagine a glass of water and, and that glass is you and the water is how much of your spirit's in there. Now imagine if you drain the water out, less and less water, less and less of your spirit in there. You just made an awful lot of room for God to put his spirit in your glass. Pour in your spirit rich in God's spirit, God's spirit, God's way of thinking about things. 
And when we think about each one of these attitudes and these rewards, the important thing is to understand, well, how is the kingdom, God's kingdom and Christ's rule going to solve the problem that this, this person has on the left-hand side? Could, because in, in the worldly sense, these are problems, aren't they? Poor in spirit, mourning, meek, hungering and thirsting. Mercy, that's almost a problem in today's society. You've got to be rough and brutal. So the poor in spirit, these are people who live their lives today without big noting themselves and saying, hey, look at me, I'm awesome. These are people who've made room for God's thoughts in their mind, made room for God's spirit. And if you've made room for God's spirit in this life, then you've got the kingdom of heaven to look forward to. It's a great blessing. What about the second one? Blessed are those who mourn. What does mourning mean? Being sad. Being sad. What, what could these people be sad about that the kingdom is going to fix up for them? They don't get life. They don't, they don't get life and they are having a hard life and they don't get what's going on. Yeah. So, th so they're sad because they're looking around at all the world and they're just looking at all the tragedies that are going on. You could be, you could be mourning for the refugee situation. You could be mourning for people in poverty. You could be mourning for all the travesties that have occurred in sort of you know, child abuse and that sort of thing. All these things relate to sin, unfortunately. They go right back to the Garden of Eden. They go right back to sin and the cause of all of our problems. And so if you're mourning for sin, if you're sitting there thinking, I'm sad because this world is full of sin and therefore looking forward to the kingdom of God when sin is going to be fixed, when Jesus Christ will be ruling over a peaceful world that doesn't have the problem, isn't that a wonderful comfort that, to expect in the kingdom of God? Blessed are those who are mourning, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, is the third one up there. Meek's a bit of a tricky word. We don't use it very often these days. What do you reckon meek is? Could you think of somebody who was called meek? It's the opposite of proud, but good answer. It's, they're related things. So what, however you can define it, as long as you've got something practical to think, so I took your chocolate away, are you going to be merciful to me? Or are you going to come running after me and grab it back? Mercy is a tricky one, isn't it? And we don't, we don't talk about showing mercy in today's life. We talk about judges showing mercy if somebody's really repentant, don't they? You know, if they're really sorry for what they've done and they give a nice speech and you can tell that they're sorry. The judge can be merciful and not, not apply the full sentence. So what does it mean for us to be merciful if we're not judges sitting in a court of law? If someone's done some wrong against you, forgiving. being forgiving of them, being willing to let the, the wrong go to one side and not call them up for it, not make them repay it in full. And what what, what is it that we get in return? We get the same. They shall obtain mercy. The, the reverse of that is really scary. Blessed are the judgmental, for they shall get judged. It's a bit of a worry, isn't it? If you're walking around judging everybody else, you get judged by Jesus Christ in return. He loves to see us show mercy because he wants to show us mercy as well when he's the king. Blessed are the pure in heart. What's the opposite of pure? Evil. Mm, evil. What else? Half. half. Yeah, half. That's getting kind of it. Impure. If, Im, impure? Corrupted. Corrupted. Yeah, there's some good words. <coughs> Blessed are the pure in heart. How, how many of us are actually capable of being pure in heart in today's world? Put your hand down, you cheeky. None of us, absolutely none of us. Jesus Christ was the only man on earth to ever be pure in heart. Absolutely, 100%. God knew what was in his heart and it was perfect. Absolutely perfect. So when he says, blessed are the pure in heart, oh, how on earth do you get there? By trying and trying and trying to get rid of the things that are corrupting it doing the best that we can to try and take on God's rightfulness, God's righteousness, 
the way that God wants to do things, that love and that mercy, being pure in heart. And the reward for that is that God, who can't possibly look on sin, in the kingdom of God, when we've been made perfect, when you've been made immortal, incorruptible, God can look on you face to face and you can have a relationship with him because you've been trying so hard to be like him that God will make you pure in heart with immortality. So you can be pure in heart like the king that's going to rule over the earth. Blessed are the peacemakers. What's the opposite of a peacemaker? What's the opposite of peace? War. The, op the opposite of war. We, we, Jamie and I have talked a lot about war in this series, haven't we? We talked about Gog bringing war on the, on the nation of Israel. Doom. Doom. Doom, doom and war. Blessed are the peacemakers who are intervening in the fight and probably getting smacked from both sides. Was, was one nice little commentary I saw on that one. If you're jumping in the way to say, hey guys, stop fighting, you jump, you're jumping into trouble to get peace in there. You're not going to have an easy time in life if you're always going through life trying to be peaceable with everybody because it's a bit like being meek all the time. Someone's going to try and take advantage of you. Someone's going to hit you knowing that you're not going to hit back. Th these are difficult things to live up to. But this is Jesus Christ's words to say, this is how I want you to be in my kingdom. This is how I want the citizens of my kingdom to act. This is the way I want to act so that my kingdom can be glorious and give glory to God. Oh, isn't peacemaker the word? Yeah. The word. It's, a, it's a thing that you've got to do all the time, isn't it? You've got to be a peacemaker, someone who actively goes around trying to get peace as opposed to prodding people and making them angry. And they shall be called the sons of God, part of God's family. God loves peace, but he's willing to finish the wicked off to get there. And then the last two are a bit tough as well. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Who was the ultimate person who was persecuted for righteousness' sake? Who was doing absolutely the right thing and got killed for it? Jesus, Jesus Christ. It's almost, it's a bit tricky, isn't it? It's almost like he's blessing himself. Yeah? He's blessing all of the attributes that are just like him, that he wants us to be like. And we can be blessed if we're persecuted for doing the right thing. If we're doing our best to be like God, be like Jesus Christ, and people try and take our toys away from us, effectively. It's like being poor in spirit. Well, God. Talk the word with boldness. Yep. That's trying to do the right thing. And God promises the kingdom of God, eternal life in the kingdom of God for everyone who's persecuted for righteousness sake, for trying to do the right thing. And then lastly, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. It's got to, it's got to be falsely for this to apply, right? <laughs> if you're doing the wrong thing and they call you a wrong person, it kind of sticks. But if you're doing the right thing and they tell you off, that's when it's falsely for my sake. And rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Look at, look at some of the examples of the apostles and disciples later on in the Bible, if, you, if you're reading through. They got a pretty rough time. You look at what happened to all of those disciples of Jesus Christ, none of them had a happy ending. They all went to their graves either early or in prison or suffering. But they could do so rejoicing because their reward was coming to them in the kingdom of God. So Jesus wants to, in his, in his speech, the last thing he says, he wants to reward everyone who's following after him and getting grief because of that. This is a king who wants to reward, a king who wants to bless, a king who wants to be merciful and kind and peaceable and look after those who are sad about the way the world is today. So I thought that was a really, just a really nice way to look at the way Christ wants his kingdom to run. 
the way he wants to be king. And if, if you read through the rest of Matthew chapter 5, there's so much more that he talks about you know, the way that we, we think and the way that we can act today that will help us to understand that kingdom so much better. When it comes to who's going to be in the kingdom of God, Matthew chapter 25 has a really interesting little parable and it's quite practical, so I just wanted to end on this one tonight. So Matthew chapter 25, Jesus is talking about, in a parable form, which is like a story, the judgment seat. So when he comes back to the earth and people who know about him and love him are gathered towards him and can be judged and either let into the kingdom or not. So Matthew chapter 25 from verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, he will sit on his throne of glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And the sheep go towards his right hand and the goats towards his left. And the king says to those sheep on his right hand side, Come, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And just this really simple bit, I love this simple bit. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And the righteous people say, when? We didn't see you, Lord. We, we didn't know it was you. And he said, if you did it to one of the least of my family, you did this for me. And the people on the left-hand side, he says to them, you didn't do any of those things. I was hungry. You didn't give me anything. I needed, I needed to be visited and you, you weren't there. And I was, I was naked and you couldn't give me any clothes. And they say the same thing. Jesus, if we'd, if we'd known it was you, we would, have, we would have done it. And he said, the least of my family, you've got to do it for them. So I, I like the very simple behaviours that are shown here. He's, he's not saying you've got to do great miracles to get into my kingdom. And if you line it up with the Beatitudes, they're very simple things to think about, really simple ways that we can act together towards each other and towards other people that help us to be like Jesus Christ and to, to be a good citizen in his kingdom to come. So just a very, very quick recap. Just, I love to so, show this one almost every night. Just to remember, what is this kingdom all about? This kingdom is about fixing sin and stopping death with immortal life for everyone who can be like Jesus Christ. Immortal life on the earth, because that was what was promised to Abraham with Christ the King reigning on his throne, the throne of his grandfather David. And it's all about the whole earth being filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. And that glory is everyone knowing about Jesus Christ, knowing about God, and being willing to take on those attitudes that he talked about, the attitudes that he wants to see in his glorious kingdom. So next week, another happy story, continuing on from tonight's happy story extraordinary changes to the world. So Jesus Christ reigning over it, the angels walking throughout it, things are going to be very, very different. Besides the fact that an earthquake will have shaken everything up, next week we'll be talking about what's, what's happening to the environment when God is directly intervening in the world again, what's going to happen to society when Jesus Christ is ruling over it, and how the place might be run in terms of the economics and politics of the world. So I hope you can join us for that one and I thank you again for coming out tonight.